Hi, my name is Alicia Lilly. I'm here with Craig Payne, podiatrist and lecturer from La Trobe University. I'm here today to discuss a number of questions and queries that I commonly receive as a podiatrist. Craig, one of the most common questions that I've received so far is from parents concerned about their children with pigeon toad. What's your opinion? Okay, good, good question. Um, first you need to determine where, where it's coming from. Uh, pigeon toe is obviously an in-toe gait. It can come from another number of places. It can come from the hip, it could come from the femur, it could come from the knee, it could come from the tibia, the ankle, or the forefoot has an metaductus. So determining where that's coming from is the first step, and that's going to direct where the intervention is likely to go at. Fortunately, most cases of pigeon toe are self-limiting, um, and there are a number of developmental timetables, depending on the child's age, that um, suggest at what angle that should be at. Most of them will be grown out of it. Some won't, but unfortunately the number of interventions and the treatment of it is very, very limited. As far as foot orthotics go, they're not going to, a typical foot orthotic is not going to help an in toe gait. Uh, sometimes a foot may pronate because of the forefoot abduction to compensate for it. Any sort of foot orthotic to try and sort of protect the foot from that is going to increase the in toe gait. There has been a lot of work done on uh, gait plates that are supposed to change the gait angle, but the, the most recent good research on that has shown it doesn't really change the gait angle at all. But kids who in-toe do tend to fall over and trip a lot more than kids that don't have an in-toe gait. And the research has certainly shown that those gait plates actually decrease the amount of tripping. So there is certainly an intervention there. Another common question that I receive from my patients in the clinic is, what do I do about my bunions? What are your opinions? Yeah, thanks. I, I assume by bunions, you mean bunions slash hallux valgus slash hallux abducto valgus. Um, numerous options for them. There's only one way to make them go away, and that's surgical. Uh, the, and then there's the conservative options, and they're going to depend on what's causing the symptoms. The symptoms may be due to a pure pressure type issue from the footwear, in, in which case that's out with the shoes, in with some new shoes, or that's uh, accommodative padding to keep the pressure off them. The other cause of symptoms in hallux valgus bunions is more of an internal derangement within the joint, such as um, early stage osteoarthritis or, or even later stage. In that case, they tend to benefit a lot from stretching, mobilisation, manipulation, exercises, um, perhaps changing the position of the joint. And that's where foot orthotics may help in changing the mechanics of the forefoot. Not actually correcting the problem, but just altering the mechanics to give some symptomatic relief. As for orthotics reversing hallux valgus, bunions, there are some people who argue that they stop the progression. There are others who argue quite adamantly that they can even reverse hallux abducto valgus. I'm not convinced. Um, I'll, go, I'll go where the evidence takes me. There is one study that has shown that orthotics actually make the um, angle of the hallux worse, but there were some question marks about the orthotics that were actually used in that particular study. I see a lot of patients in the clinic who come to me previously diagnosed with a leg length discrepancy. What are your treatment plans? Um, if you look closely enough, everyone's probably got a leg length difference. Um, using the most sensitive um, imaging testing, you'd probably find a leg length difference in everyone. So it'd be very rare for anyone to have a, have a normal leg length difference. That doesn't mean the difference is so slight that it's never going to cause a problem. So the challenge with the leg link difference is at what point does the difference become significant to contribute to the problem they've got? And there is no evidence to support that. It's often very profession specific. Some professions think a millimetre is very significant. Others will think uh, two centimetres is not enough to be important. So there's a lot, a lot of debate going on as to where that cutoff point is. As to what causes the leg link difference, um, there are two types, there's functional and there's structural. A, a structural leg length difference will imply that perhaps the femur or the tibia, there's a shortage in one of those compared to the contralateral side. A functional leg length difference, there's potentially something going on proximally in the hip or the sacroiliac or low back joint that may cause a functional difference in the length. But also having one foot that pronates more than the other can shorten a limb. And Sanders work showed that foot pronation can shorten a limb by up to uh, a centimetre, which is quite a lot. As to um, what the body does with that leg length, some will argue, yes, that's a, a problem and needs to be treated. Other people will argue that the human body is quite remarkable and it can adapt and compensate for that leg length difference and cause no problems. The, 
most of the research shows that the foot generally comp sorry the, the leg generally compensates for leg length difference by having the knee slightly more flexed or the hip flexed and a slight pelvic tilt. Now whether that causes any problems is, is where the debate is. One thing the body does not do is doesn't pronate the foot to compensate and that's a, a quite a significant myth within the podiatric literature that foot pronation can be used as a compensation by the body. Um, you see the short leg pronating more in just as many people as you see the long leg pronating more and the three studies that have had look, actually looked at it have, have not found that to be the case at all. Um, so that certainly is a myth that's been going on. However, if one foot does pronate more than the other, that will shorten the limb and that's potentially amenable to foot orthotic interventions. If someone has presents with symptoms and they have a leg length difference, the next challenge to this is to decide is that leg length difference contributing to the problem or not. Some people will argue, yes it is, it's important. Other people will argue, no it won't. So there's certainly a challenge for the clinician in trying to make that kind of decision. My general policy is that if I think that a leg length difference is, is contributing, I will try and measure it, acknowledging that the measurements are somewhat unreliable. Whatever I measure it at, and say for argument's sake I measure it at one centimetre, taking into account there are some issues with the reliability of the measurements, I generally I treat half that. So if I measured one centimetre, would put half a centimetre heel raise in, usually something quite firm. If they need a heel raise of over one centimetre, we're probably going to look at involving someone else to do a full foot, foot um, raise rather than just a heel raise. A lot of parents are concerned about what footwear their children should be in. Are you more on the opinion that they should be barefoot or that they should be in more supportive shoes? Another good question. Um, I, I don't exactly have an answer. I think everyone would agree that kids probably should be as barefoot as much as possible to let normal development happen, uh, for the muscles to strengthen, to feel the environment, to get sensory experiences, all those kinds of issues. Where the, where the debate might be as to whether wearing shoes does harm and there's not one piece of evidence to suggest that. There are certainly a lot of people speculating that um, shoes might weaken muscles. Um, I certainly don't see that. Um, there are certainly suggestions that kids might get more flat feet um, from wearing shoes but kids that go barefoot all the time also develop flat feet. So uh, again, no evidence, a lot of rhetoric, um, a lot of arguments. There are certainly arguments, or there has been some research done that's shown that kids that wear shoes do tend to have more problems, but what the people interpreting that research are missing is that kids that wear shoes tend to walk on more on hard surfaces. So is the hard surface the problem or is the shoe the problem? I mean, I, I assume the shoe is the problem, but you can't draw those kinds of conclusions that people are making. So I think bare feet as much as possible, footwear when they need, need to have some protection from the environment, well, as, as a parent myself with two young twins, I'm not going to do anything that's going to potentially harm them. I have them as barefoot as much as they want to be, and I put them in shoes when it, it's required that they need to be in shoes. As twins, one of them actually wears shoes uh, more than the other, but the one that wears shoes less often, her foot is actually flatter than the other one, which does make a mockery of all the rhetoric and claims being made in the absence of evidence. There seems to be a lot of hype around barefoot running at the moment. Could you give us some pros and cons to barefoot running versus supportive footwear running? Okay, a very topical question at the moment, and I've certainly made my views known in a number of different um, places. And I, I, I have no, no problems with barefoot running at all. I, I even yesterday started running in a pair of minimum shoes myself. And, but there is a lot of debate going on and, and I've tried to reframe the debate. It's not a, I don't think it's a debate about whether we should or shouldn't be running barefoot. The issue I have is the misuse, uh, misrepresentation, uh, misinterpretation of the science by people trying to promote barefoot running as the end all and be all. There are many claim benefits for barefoot running. Uh, a particularly common one is the reduced injury rate. Again, no evidence to support that, no evidence to say that there's not either, but you only have to go to any of the barefoot running websites and all you see are barefoot runners asking for advice on their injury. You talk to key people who work in running injury clinics and they're seeing a lot of barefoot running injuries. So there's no doubt um, a number of people who were running in shoes who are now running barefoot are getting less injuries, but there's also no doubt there are a lot of people getting injuries. and that's So I'm not so sure about this claim benefit of, of decreased injury. There's certainly a lot of claims about it increasing muscle strength. And again, I, I assume it does, but some evidence that I recently saw has actually showed that it doesn't increase muscle strength. So I'll, I'll wait till we get more, more data on that. But that's based on the assumption that the muscles were actually weak to start with. 
and also based on the assumption that running shoes weaken muscles. Again, no evidence that do that. And if we were to take a, a, a non-runner and we were to start them running tomorrow in the most motion controlling running shoe, they're going to be using their muscles more. Their muscles are going to get stronger. So I, I just fail to see how these, these um, shoes weaken muscles. We also know from evidence that motion control running shoes do not actually control motion of the foot at all. So the muscles are still working. Um, so that doesn't stack up to scrutiny. The other issue is, and again, when I, when I raise this issue of these barefoot runners getting injuries, they, the, the pretty common answer is uh, the problem was they didn't transition properly to barefoot running or there was a training error. When I asked them, well, why can't an injury in a running shoe? Because, of course, they will claim that the, the running shoe caused the injury, and I will say, well, why can't the injury in a running shoe be a training error? So, again, I think there's a lot of misuse, misrepresentation of the science. I have even seen um, claims that barefoot running, uh, sorry, I'll rephrase that. I've even seen claims that there is accumulating research showing that barefoot running benefits the immune system, when in reality there's not one piece of research that even comes remotely close to saying that. But it was a myth that someone created on the internet and it just escalated from there. So there, there's a lot of so the debate's not really about whether you should or shouldn't barefoot running. I think all runners should be doing at least some barefoot running. I think it will benefit all of them. I think some of the elite runners are running barefoot. If you look at the elite runners, um, none of them are training barefoot, and they all run fast. And if there was a huge benefit, I'm assuming they would take it. I also, you know, going back to the muscle strength issue, I think there are issues with if barefoot running does make the muscles stronger. Well. Why does it make them stronger? It makes them stronger because the muscles are having to work harder. Well, if, if the muscles are working harder, to me, that potentially means the gait's inefficient. Surely an efficient gait would require less muscle e effort. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm saying we just don't know. We're getting these claims on one side um, and a la lack of science to support them. Having said that, I, there has been a bit of a shift recently away from um, perhaps the debate in towards it's about f running form, and runners are paying a lot more attention to their form. Yes, some runners who are heel strikers will benefit from transitioning to being midfoot or forefoot strikers, and potentially ver vice versa. If you look at any slow motion videos of the top 10 finishers for any major marathon around the world, you know, some are heel strike, some midfoot strike, and some forefoot strike, and they all run fast. At the end of the day, it's individual. It's what suits each individual. So Craig, it's my understanding that there's a number of elite runners who have chosen to wear barefoot technology. What have you heard about that? Um, the, as far as I know, there are no elite runners running barefoot at the moment. I assume and, and know a number that are doing a number of barefoot drills, which they incorporate into their training, which is fine. But there have been examples in the past. Um, Abiba Bakela won the 1960 Rome Marathon um, barefoot and that often gets promoted as, by the barefoot community as an example of what someone can do. But what they don't tell you is that four years later at the Tokyo Olympics, he actually wore shoes and was able to run faster and he broke a world record. You often see um, the example of Zola Budd, who competed, for, Zola Budd from South Africa, who competed in the 1500 metres barefoot. Um, but there's now a quote from her in the news media saying that she eventually had to start wearing shoes to stop all the injuries that she was getting. So there have been some isolated examples, but they're not very good examples. I think that there is also a quote from an elite runner in the Boston Marathon recently, and he pretty much said that he was going to keep wearing shoes until someone wearing barefoot went past him. As if you can run faster barefoot, I think, again, the jury's still out on that. There is some good evidence that running shoes, the weight of a running shoe does slow you down and does require more energy. But since that research was done, the weight of the average running shoes come down quite substantially. So that, that, that's a potential advantage to barefoot running is that you haven't got the weight of the shoe. But as I mentioned earlier, that if the muscles get stronger running barefoot, it must be because the muscles are working harder. So that's going to you means you're going to fatigue earlier running barefoot than would you would running with shoes. So again, I think I think it, it swings and roundabouts with that. So if you were to have a patient that came into the clinic asking whether mm. barefoot technology would be appropriate for them, what treatment mm. advice would you offer them? Yeah. I, I have no problems with anyone wanting to do it. I, I have no objections to barefoot running. I think everyone should benefit from it. And and by the way, when I say barefoot running, I, I mean minimalist running as well. It's it's, it's slightly different. Um, 
the biggest problem with barefoot running, minimalist running, is the transition to it. And if that's not done properly, injuries will happen. Um, advice needs to be taken on a transition protocol that's going to last for up to several months. And, and it will hurt. It, it's not exa a painless exercise to get through. It's going to start just barefoot round home, barefoot walks, very short runs, longer runs over a period of times. And there are a number of good books to, that are available. I, I recently, to, to, to learn more on this, went out and brought a number of barefoot running books. Um, and I was quite horrified by several of them. They were written like party political manifestos and didn't have any useful information at all. But the one book I did enjoy and actually didn't try and ram it down your throat and gave a lot of good practical advice was a book by Craig Richards called um, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Barefoot Running. And I'd certainly recommend that to anyone who wanted to start um, barefoot running.